my mentality has always been to get the job done and do it the best. Hey everybody, welcome to Identity Unveiled. We are a lifestyle platform that talks about career, beauty, health, and to help support the advancement of Asian American women to the executive ranks. Esther Ha is the chef at Momofuku Co. Co is two Michelin stars, and it, she just received that actually a year after opening and has maintained it since 2009. And in 2015, Co was awarded three stars by the New York Times. And in 2019, Co was also ranked number 76 on the world's 50 best restaurants. Welcome, Esther. Tell us, how did you start your journey as a chef? I think my story is a little different than most other um, chefs out there. Um, I had no intention of going into the industry. I went to undergrad, um, pursued a degree in psychology, writing my thesis. And I realized that everything that I wanted to focus on was food related, whether that was trying to come up with different therapies based on cultural um, food experiences um, in Asian American communities. And then afterwards, just applying for different grant programs, trying to figure out what I was doing with the rest of my life. Um, and when those fell through, I had a conversation with my parents about going to a culinary arts program back near home. So I grew up in Connecticut. So New York City seemed like the best place to end up after college. So I ended up going to ICC. Um, they're now co-joint with ICE, but at the time I was International Culinary Center. I went there for six months and kind of just fell in love with the kitchen, um, fell in love with the intensity of it, the immediate satisfaction of producing something and making it taste good or like seeing people eat it and just the structure and organization of working in a kitchen. Um, but I, I left school and I thought uh, I wanted to be a journalist. Being in a kitchen wasn't really an option from my parents. Um, they always wanted me to go back to school. They wanted me to have a more standard lifestyle than being a chef. Um, hated the fact that I started loving cooking um, I would come home with like burns on my arms and my mom would cry. Um, but then I don't know, I, I started at Cafe Balloon with the intention of leaving after nine months. I was like, nine months is good. I can put it on my resume. I could go into journalism. Um, I think six months in, I was invited to be an assistant to one of the line cooks for a Young Chefs competition. Um, Who won, Chef? We got second. We got second. Yeah. And the following year, I did the same thing with my sous chef at the time. and got second again. And yeah, it's just spiraled from there. I haven't left. So what's a day in a life like as an executive chef? Uh, I'm constant. I wake up, I constantly check my emails, um, see if I've missed anything, get in. I, if the market's open, I'll probably stop by the market um, without my team knowing. And then yeah, head into work do my rounds. I'll check in with all the teams. Um, we have three separate teams that kind of work in tandem with each other. Um, so I'll check in with each manager in charge of those spaces, um, check in with our front of house team, see, see who's coming in, check the books. There's a lot of admin that needs to happen from the exec chef as opposed to the rest of the team. Just a lot of behind the scenes action. And then we can talk about food, menu progression, always looking towards the future, figuring out a schedule, check-in days. What was the toughest thing you overcame to become the executive chef at Co? Yeah, Co was, Co was an interesting place when I first joined. Um, I had applied to Co first straight out of culinary school because that's I knew that's where I wanted to work. It was a very different kitchen experience than anywhere else in the city. Um, it was open kitchen. The cook's Back of house serve the guests. Um, there was no like front of house, back of house barrier. They only wanted experienced cooks. So I went to Cafe Balloon thinking this was going to be it. And then when I started to love it, I was like, wait, okay, I'm going to work here. I'm going to get to a point where I can walk into Co and say, hire me now. Um, and when I first started there, it was a very, it was a male dominant kitchen. Um, I think in my time at Co, there's always only been one female cook um, in the kitchen at one time, maybe two, if that first one could last long enough. And it was a lot of, yeah, it was a lot of ego, um, but that's some of the best chefs in the world have the biggest egos. 
And I think that culture is changing now, um, post pandemic. Um, I think my, my biggest hurdle in the last six years I've been there has been to just navigate different personalities um, and learn what I want to learn from each of these individuals, as opposed to harping on the negative. So Esther, let me pause you on that because yeah. working with different personalities, that's, that's, that's hard. So I'm curious as to what did that do? Like, how did you show up when you were managing and navigating through those different personalities? I think as a manager, I definitely had a learning curve. I became a sous chef and at co and that was my first management position ever. Um, and I definitely went through a phase where I was just mimicking what I had seen. It was a lot of yelling. It was a lot of unnecessary. Yeah. It was just unnecessary in, in retrospect. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's what I learned, um, and seen throughout the last couple years, um, to having taken over and taken a bit more ownership of my team. I, I see them as more of a family now, um, less of staff where you have to have a relationship with everyone, um, like a very specific personal relationship with everyone. Um, whether that is just like from a manager to a staff relationship, or if it exceeds beyond that to a friendship, but you need to know individually where everyone is at work, like professionally, but also personally. Um, so you can navigate their day to day instead of just, because at the end of the day, like the biggest thing that my boyfriend always tells me is um, <laughs> that it's just cooking. You're not, you're not doing open heart surgery. You're not trying to save a life here. You're just trying to make people happy by feeding them good food. But if the people behind that cooking process aren't happy, then what is the point? This is a very demanding profession. And when it comes to finding balance between your career, your personal commitments and your health, where do you struggle? You talk about needing to know the, you know, the professional and personal sides of your team. I mean, what do you do to kind of balance itself, balance those aspects? Yeah, I'm still, I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, I definitely struggle with finding time for my health. I'm always like, a, if things need to happen at work, I will be at work. So trying to figure that out. I've The easiest thing for me to do is not check my emails over the weekend um, and just let everyone else know that it is our weekend. Like if certain people aren't going to answer emails on Saturday and Sundays because it's their weekend, then restaurant workers and managers are also privy to their Sunday, Monday weekend. Yeah, beyond that, still trying to figure it out, which I think is why I'm projecting more so on my team to figure it out. <laughs> There's a statistic out there that says that almost 77% of all chefs are men. Hmm. Did this, did that disparity work against you in your career path to become executive chef? Yeah, I don't think anyone expected me to take over Co. But I had I had this uh, this nickname growing up in kitchens. They called me the sniper. Yeah. Um, just because no one no one could see it coming. Like it was, I was a very um I was a very quiet cook that just kind of got everything done until yeah, unless there was like a cook in the background struggling. Um, and I would make sure to let them know that they were struggling and help them and try to help them. But I would let them know that they were doing things wrong. Um, and I just kind of like moved up in the, in, in the industry. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I've never been somebody that's like, Oh, where's the spotlight? Um, why aren't you acknowledging my work? My mentality has always been to get the job done and do it the best. Um, not the best that I can do, but the best. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I always, I was always the person that was set up the the fastest um, and running around to like help the bigger picture of like the rest of the line get set up as a cook. As a Sue, I was probably doing more work than some of the other Sue's there um, just because I wanted to, like, it wasn't like people were putting more work on my plate. I was just so curious and um, I work best under stress. No, I think I think that is your secret sauce. I remember being a designer. Uh, one of my professors told me the same thing. There are a lot of people that talk. There's a lot of people with egos, especially people that think in this creative world that they're so talented or so beautiful, whether it be fashion modeling. I remember in the modeling world, 
I want that they're the most gorgeous person. There's really the very few that are talented and very few that have the work ethic. And I haven't seen you in the, obviously in the kitchen, but you made it to where you are because you have an incredible work ethic. And I think your secret sauce is that you, you kept your head down and you were able to navigate egos. And I like your, your perspective on how to push things away. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I think actually as a woman, the advantage that you have in your strength is, um, like you said, you were able to work with people and you have a different type of EQ that maybe other male dominant chefs. Yeah. It's, it's a different world. And so for everyone listening out there, you know, um, Michelin star chef is one of the highest honors in the culinary world. It is evaluated. It is deemed they come in and, and they definitely being a Michelin star sets a standard for the finest in the restaurant industry. So I have a question working in it with some powerful egos. And I'm not saying David Chang has one. I would love to learn what's it like working with David Chang. It's been since taking over um, in my new position, it's been pretty nice. Um, I didn't really interact with him prior to the pandemic. Um, I think now, so he used to live a bi-coastal life and now he lives um, solely based out of LA. Um, he has two adorable sons and a wife and all of that. So kudos to him, but he's always been, Co is lucky where within the restaurant group, um, we are the least restricted for what we want to do or what we can do in terms of menu and service. So his thing to me has always been, hey, like I'm always, I'm always here if you want to talk or like bounce ideas off of me, like you can send me recipes and I'll R&D them at home and give you critique. Um, but he's not physically in the area to like come in all the time. So yeah, it's kind of like a, you know, the supports there in the back, but he's, it's not like this. Um, it's not like a ball and chain kind of thing, which yeah. is a nice feeling. It's incredible. He is. Um, and if you guys don't know, but David Chang is one of, one of the most famous celebrated chefs with, I don't know how many restaurants he has today. He's on Netflix. Yeah. Um, I don't know, how many are there? I think there's seven now across the country. I was watching a, a, a video yesterday. Diane shared with me what it takes to be a, a Michelin starred chef. <laughs> and, you know, and I know she's really familiar with the, the restaurant world. So I was, I was enamored by just what it takes to be inspired. And I do executive coaching. And uh, one of the things that many people like during the pandemic and even this kind of post pandemic era is finding motivation and inspiration to just kind of stay focused on, on their, their, their job. And it just, people feel a little muddled. You know, where do you find inspiration? I think it's in my day to day. Um, a lot of what I cook, like there's certain chefs that like are out there and see a piece of art and know exactly like, oh, I want that on a plate. And I'm always, I'm always like so, so astonished by something like that because my mind doesn't work that way. And I kind of wish it did. Um, but my, my inspiration is mostly from like memories or like nostalgia, um, something familiar. I love making food that tastes familiar at the core, but you make it slightly unfamiliar so that it keeps the guests guessing. Or you take something that's familiar to you, whether it's like, um, like Korean foods that I grew up with, and you present them in a very Western way where you can't necessarily um, pinpoint that it's Korean, but it feeds the same purpose. How do you honor your culture? I think in, it's just innate. I think um, the biggest thing when I took over, I didn't want to be pigeonholed as a Korean chef um, because I am Korean, but I'm also I'm Korean American. Like I was born and raised here and I would never want to come into the food scene and say, I know everything about Korean food because I don't, I know the food that my parents cooked for me my entire life. Um, and that's a very small snippet of Korean cuisine. So you'll see it in a lot of our dishes where there are little nods to my background and my, um, my upbringing. Um, it's the Asian American experience for me. That's, that's overriding um, the Korean especially going to school. Um, I went to college out in Claremont, California. Mm. So 
going from an East Coast school where you don't talk about anything about Asian American history to a California, like a Southern California liberal arts college where they like jump right into Japanese internment camps and all these things that you never knew about growing up, um, I think is the biggest um, driving force yeah, behind my cooking. You know, it's a powerful statement to say that you um, don't want to, while you have snippets of Korean food in your creation, you don't want to say, hey, you know, I'm all about Korean food. That's, that's a really fine line. It's a powerful statement. Um, what do you think about being on Food Network? I mean, I know chefs want that career. Is that something in your, in your cards? I don't, uh, I don't know if network TV is for me. Um, mostly because I, I am not a good self-promoter. Um, and I like to be like the strings behind the action as opposed to like up on stage. I like being the the biggest thing I love about my role now is that yes, like I, my name is across the restaurant now. It's my name on the line for everything, but in the thick of it, like my, my chef team is the one that's doing everything. Um, and I'm behind the scenes drawing a vision and trying to drive that through um, with the full support of my team. And so it's, yeah, it kind of works out where I'm not like in the thick of it like interacting with guests as much. I'm not like the ones really um, at the forefront of the stage. Um, and I can be behind the scenes more um, with a bit more structure and guidance in that sort of way. And Food Network is, it makes me very anxious just thinking about like being in front of a screen or like seeing my face on a screen. Like it's, <laughs> maybe that'll change, but not, not nine times soon, I think. <laughs> that says a lot about your leadership. Esther, you have really yeah. cool leadership and in, in giving your credit to the team and leading behind the scenes. Esther, what was one thing you just did not expect as you reflect upon your journey to becoming an executive chef? Uh, I think being an executive chef right now is something I never thought um, would have happened. And I don't think it would have happened if the pandemic didn't happen. And I told I told my, my former chef this when they offered me the position. I don't know if I would have taken the position if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic trying to rebuild a restaurant. Um, like if, it, if the restaurant was in full swing and extremely successful, I don't know if I would have taken it. I might've walked. Yeah, there was, a, there was a voice in my head when the offer was made and I took some time to think about it. And I thought this might be the best opportunity. Like the, the ability to <clears throat> rebuild a team um, which I think a lot of people would have shied away from. Um, I saw it as probably the greatest opportunity um, to be given where you start off with an immediate management team that was built of all my friends. They're some of the closest friends that I have um, that have gone up through the ranks with me at Co and had worked alongside as cooks together. Um, and the four of us kind of rebuilt our line cook team from scratch. Um, and it's, yeah, it's probably the best team I've ever worked with at Co in terms of just how cohesive, um, the individuals are. And I think, uh, yeah, I think that stems directly from the people that went searching for, for them. That's incredible. You know, when you walk into a kitchen that you manage, you know, you really emotionally own, everyone's doing their part. It's mm -hmm. like a type of, you know, run ship. That's an incredible feeling. Um, you know, the holidays are on the corner, and I know you mentioned you cook with nostalgia, with hints of your heritage, right? What are some recipes you would recommend for executive woman? Hmm. Something that's fast, something that's easy. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, my dad used to, this is, this is very Korean American, but my dad for Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving was the only holiday that my mom would cook an American traditional Thanksgiving meal. Um, and my dad's not, does not like, like plain American food. Um, and always insisted that we make a kimchi stuffing for the turkey. Um, Delicious. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's really simple. So, I mean, even that would be like, you, it's, you're essentially making kimchi fried rice as a mix um, with like sweet glutinous rice. Incredible. Well, we had the most incredible time, Esther, again, Huge congratulations on earning one of the highest honors as a Michelin two-star restaurant. 
Thanks again, Esther. And for those of you listening, be sure to check out our YouTube channel at Identity Unveiled.